Uh, welcome uh, to today's uh, Climate Finance and Economics eAccess Young Scholars webinar. My name is Lisa Kleinerhuis, and I would like to welcome you to our guest speaker today, Adelina Barbela, who will be presenting her paper entitled Reducing Carbon Using Regulatory and Financial Market Tools. Adelina Barbela is an assistant professor of finance at the Alberta School of Business at the University of Alberta. Her work in the field of climate finance has been receiving recognition through awards such as the Best uh, Paper Award at the AFA in 2023 and the Best Paper Award for Impactful Research at GrassFeed 2022. Adelina's research interests are in the areas of climate finance, corporate finance, and information economics. Before I give the floor to Adelina, I would like to invite the audience to take a short survey. So the poll questions that we are asking you uh, are two. The first question is, do you think market-based solutions to addressing climate change can be a substitute to government regulation? Please answer this question with a yes or no. The second question is, if your objective function was to reduce negative externalities associated with climate change, which of the actions below would you give more utility of assurance that your objective is achieved? The options to answer are A, funding firms or projects which reduce negative externalities, B, voting for the implementation of climate regulation, or C, none. I will give you one minute to give an answer to these two poll questions, and then I will read out the results. So the outcome of the survey is that 73% of you believe that uh, market-based solutions cannot be a solution to addressing climate change. Uh, and the outcome of the second question is uh, more balanced. 41% uh, uh, of you think that funding firms or projects which reduce negative externalities uh, gives most assurance uh, that your objective is achieved of uh, reducing negative externalities. And 55% of you believe that uh, voting for the implementation of climate regulation gives you most assurance uh, that your uh, objective is achieved to reduce negative externalities. Um, so thank you so much for taking place in this brief poll. We will now, uh, without further ado, hand the floor to our speaker, Adelina, who once again will be speaking about reducing carbon using regulatory and financial market tools. Adelina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisa, for the introduction and for uh, the poll. So, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to have this platform to be here and, and present my work. And um, um, yeah, especially in light of the the, the results of the survey. Uh, so I think um, you, what what I have to say, you, you might find it interesting. What uh, what I have to say. So uh, this is a, a work joint work with Frank and Allen and uh, who, who's at Imperial College and Fede Gazeni, who's currently at the World Bank, and we used to be colleagues in the PhD uh, at Imperial. Uh, so. Yeah, the, the work is titled Reducing Carbon Using a Regulatory and Financial Market Tools. And well, uh, this, this paper is motivated by the, um, by the observed heterogeneity or disagreement, if you will, that exists with, with, re, with regards to the issue of pricing carbon. So by and large, we agree that, uh, that uh, um, uh, you know, climate change has, has risen on the agenda of policymakers worldwide. And in principle, there's agreement that that uh, the implementation of a regulatory tool is, is needed, but we have we haven't been very successful at, at, at doing that. So we're far from having reached consensus globally on how to address this this global externality. So as you observe in this in this figure, um, 
there is great heterogeneity across countries with respect to whether or not carbon pricing regulation has been implemented in the form that it takes. We have uh, some countries um, uh, that have implemented a carbon tax, which involves charging a, a price for each unit of, of pollution, and uh, others have implemented a, a, a cap and trade system, or ETS, which involves capping the total quantity of emissions, allocating permits to emitters and allowing them to trade uh, among, uh, among each other. Uh, we also have a few jurisdictions in which we have two. We have countries, right, in, in which we have, the both tools have been implemented, but by and large, nothing has been done. Some some countries are considering, but uh, but uh, yes, basically regulation is missing, right? And uh, we're going to take this uh, this idea seriously. And uh, so there are many reasons um, um, behind this. An important one that we're going to think about in this paper is the lack of political support from the population. And typically, the carbon tax has been met with uh, more resistance uh, um, relative to, to the cap and trade. And this can be driven by preferences. It can be driven by concern for the environment or exposure to climate shocks, as well as global equity issues uh, uh, related to the fact that countries that have contributed uh, the most to climate change are the ones that are, are uh, suffering the least, or conversely, countries that have contributed the least are the most affected. And they also have uh, the least resources to invest in adaptation and mitigation. And well, the resources that are required to meet the Paris Agreement goals of keeping temperature below uh, 1.5 are, are significant. There's quite a bit of a, a range with regards to the estimates needed, but uh, they are significant and they're well beyond what governments can, uh, can provide. Additionally, here, uh, additionally, the carbon prices implied by the adopted regulatory tools are below the consensus of what would be needed to meet the Paris Agreement goals. So here I'm plotting the, the carbon price implied by the regulatory tools that I showed in the previous slide, so by either the, the tax or the ETS. And uh, well, the first thing to note is that we have great variation. And even in countries where this is, this is a, a very, um, where, where the carbon price is very high, well, this is still below the consensus of what would be needed in order to meet the Paris Agreement goal. So against the background of this heterogeneous and incomplete uh, um, and insufficient uh, regulation, in the last years we have seen a lot of development from, from the private sector and private, um, in capital markets in particular. And uh, um, now financial markets are deploying um, through debt markets almost six trillion uh, in financing projects that are sustainability oriented. So this can include projects that have an environmental goal or, or focus, a social focus or a combination of the two. And when it's a the combination, they're referred to as sustainability bonds or loans. Well, anyway, so there has been a proliferation of products in addition to this increase that I'm talking about. And, uh, but the, the products that I wanna draw your attention to are the ones that are shaded in red, namely sustainability linked loans and bonds. So by the way, these are 1.6 trillion of the overall volume of what I call sustainability debt market. So, uh, and, and they continue to increase. So it, it, it's not a, a trivial amount, but the point about this is I wanna highlight their design. So uh, as their name suggests, the, the, they are linked, the, the, the interest rate or the coupons associated with these instruments is linked to the sustainability performance of the issuer. And they're linked in such a way that if the issuer fails to achieve a pre-agreed target, then the interest rate increases. But if the issuer beats the target, then the interest rate is decreased. So these operate through, a, a, um, through the cost of capital, basically. And crucially, most of the time, this sustainability target is represented by carbon emissions. So to give you a, a, a quick example, so this is a, a sustainability linked uh, bond uh, issued by Uruguay in 2022. Uh, and the target or the, the KPI underlying this is the percentage decrease in aggregate uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions for real GDP uh, over this, uh, this time period. And so the, the, we have an initial coupon that is specified and then, and then the, 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 the coupon can increase or decrease. So in this case, the coupon is going to increase if the KPI or if, if Uruguay fails to decrease uh, emissions by more than 50%, which is, which is emission, but you know the, the, the horizon is how it is. 
and then uh, but the coupon will decrease if Uruguay uh, uh, reduces emissions by more than 52 percent and then we also have this sort of margin of error right and uh, you know, so so this this bond was uh, was oversubscribed, and this is this is to give you a sense of how how these products look like, and to say that they they exist, demand for them exists, and um, and um, we'll take this as a as a proof of concept and motivation, and think about its similar security designs, which uh, represent a, a decentralized or market based instrument for for pricing emissions that could in principle be equivalent to a carbon tax or a regulatory tool. Uh, but which has the advantage that it's not subject to political constraints. All right, and so um, so yeah, that's one advantage of the market solution is the circumventing the political issues. Another advantage um, is that as of today, so here in green, I'm showing you the percentage of sustainability linked debt uh, relative to all debt issued since 2013 per country. And in blue, it's the, the old map where I was showing the, the carbon, the regulation implied price of carbon. And the takeaway from this figure is to say that uh, financial markets have a reach that goes beyond the current reach of regulation. So we have active carbon and sustainability linked markets in, 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 uh, in countries where we don't have uh, taxes. But of course, we also have uh, taxes or other types of carbon pricing regulation. But of course, we also have countries in which uh, so there is coexistence of, the, of both market and regulated tool. So this is uh, um, sort of like the background, the, the, the introduction, if you will. Now let's move on to, to the research questions. What is it that we do in this paper? So, we want to understand the, the um, against the background of this heterogeneity and fragmented and political support for regulation and the increasingly important role that markets play. We want to understand the interaction between regulatory and financial market tools for price and carbon. In particular, we're going to be thinking about a carbon tax, and we want to understand the conditions under which a carbon tax can be implemented when the regulator is subject to a medium voter constraint, meaning that at least half of the population has to be happy with implementing a tax. Then we want to understand the conditions under which we see the emerge of, emergence of what we call carbon contingent financing. So these are a financing agreements whereby the cost of debt of the issuer will increase if the issuer increases emissions above a target, but it will decrease otherwise. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is what we have in mind when we say carbon contingent financing. It's similar to the instruments I showed you. So we want to understand when we expect this type of financing to emerge. And, uh, and, uh, and then importantly, we want to derive the optimal tax in a world in which we have political constraints and financial markets, right? So. Uh, in sum, we want to understand the conditions under which uh, carbon contingent financing can be equivalent to a carbon tax and can potentially substitute a carbon tax. And this is important because it gives us an insight into whether we can deploy finance uh, in markets or in situations in which uh, political support for regulation is missing. So we have a simple model in which, uh, um, uh, so it's, it's a linear model. Uh, this is going to deliver the main insights and the mechanism in, in, in the paper, uh, but uh, because it's linear, we can either have a, a, a regulation or a carbon contingent financing in this, uh, in this model. Um, and then we extend this model because, uh, well, we want to allow for the coexistence of the two tools and um, say something about the intensive margin interaction uh, between the two. And uh, uh, yeah, so, so um, I don't know how much of the extended model I will, I will get to go through, but as I said, the linear model really uh, develop, um, delivers uh, the, the key intuition and, and mechanism. Okay, now quickly the model setup. So we have um, a model in which um, agents can invest in polluting or non-polluting technology. technologies. We have two classes of investors, so-called standard and environmental uh, agents. And these are risk neutral and behave atomistically uh, with respect to global emissions when they invest, right? So uh, the regulator chooses a, a carbon tax subject to the median voter constraint that at least half the population has to be in favor of the tax. And then uh, we, uh, we introduce the financial market solution 
um, where we let agents to lend and borrow among each other using these types of securities, carbon contingent security, then have the following structure. So for a principal D, the payoff at the following date is, um, is well, we have a fixed rate of return, our, our bar, and then we have this second component that is, uh, uh, that is varying. It's contingent on, on how emissions are relative to a benchmark. So rho is what we call the market implied price of carbon. And then E bar is the, the target level of, of, of emissions. This is typically agreed when, when you enter in a contract. And E is the realized emission. So what's going to happen here, if your realized emissions are above the target, what you have to repay, the, the amount that you're going to have to repay is higher. But if the realized emissions are below the target, uh, then your repayment is lower. So, uh, um, so th yeah, this is uh, the idea that, uh, that we wanted to uh, capture here. So, okay, so what we do is um, we're gonna first solve for the tax uh, with or without imposing this median voter constraint. Then we're gonna introduce financial markets and basically solve for the tax again and ask ourselves how does support for the tax change when we have financial markets in this, uh, in this economy. All right, so what are the, the a preview of the findings here? Um, so we find that actually the pricing incentives provided by these types of securities that make the cost of debt contingent on the issuer's uh, carbon emissions relative to your target can be equivalent to a carbon tax. So they provide the same, uh, uh, um, in, they provide incentive to, to basically uh, reduce uh, uh, carbon. The point of a carbon tax would be to less effort, to correct this less effort economy in which our uh, the polluting uh, technology is financed by financially motivated what we call the, the standard agents. Uh, but the issue with just imposing the carbon tax is, is you know, we, we don't seem to be able to do that. Um, um, so there are frictions to this. So in particular, we, we focus on this, this voting political friction. Uh, so, so then we, we you know, uh, then we turn our, our focus on, on financial markets. So it turns out if there is no political support for the tax, carbon contingent financing, which is going to pr be provided by environmental agents to standard agents, can substitute regulation and enhance its welfare. However, <laughs> so there is a, a caveat here. The existence of financial markets is going to weaken the support for regulation. And uh, well, why is that the case? So as I as I will detail when um, when we talk about preferences, well, these environmental agents they uh, um, they value uh, the emissions associated with the action, so they value doing the right thing. And if through lending they can contribute to reforming other agents and inducing them to switch their investment from a polluting one to a non-polluting one, then they're going to internalize this, and uh, um, so. So they prefer the market solution basically because they are the ones who get to to make the change. And then standard agents, uh, for standard agents, it's pretty clear that well through financial markets they tend to potentially benefit and be compensated. They receive a, a basically a payment or a subsidy if they um, uh, if they are successful at reducing emissions. So they also have a preference for. Uh, for the financial market solution. So if when, you know, when, when they, they trade off, you know, the life in an economy with a carbon tax versus an economy with a financial market, they have a preference for, uh, for market. So as a consequence, welfare losses can occur when the presence of markets shift the economy from one that would support a carbon tax to one that doesn't, but the capital deployed is not enough. So if financial markets would be like sort of very, very large deep pockets, they could finance the transition of everyone, then, then we have uh, no problem. But when the capital is not sufficient, we just get this effect of, of pushing away regulation, but we can't afford to, to finance the transition of everybody. Okay, so this is basically the, the, the paper in a nutshell, and I will uh, move on to providing more details. And before doing so very quickly, I want to highlight the, the, the contribution here. So uh, there, there is a literature that has looked at the, the conditions and the channels through which investments by agents with so-called so pro-social or environmental preferences uh, uh, can, uh, can have an impact by reforming firms. And they focus on the cost of capital channel and we also contribute to this literature, whereas most of the literature has looked at, at an equity channel. 
uh, we looked at, at the debt. Uh, we abstract from any type of corporate governance considerations uh, um, and the firm's decisions to reform uh, because uh, we just look at technologies that are financed by age and so we don't have any type of corporate governance issues. But um, so, so yes, we also look at the, corp the cost of capital channel, but our focus is on the interaction between security design and regulation, which is something new. Uh, and then uh, there is also this trend of the literature that has looked at Thailand corporate behavior and regulation and the, the, how they do mix. Most of it tends to focus on market responses to the anticipation of regulation, whereas our focus on, is on seeing how the implementation, uh, how, how markets uh, basically affect um, the implementation of regulation. And importantly, we do place a lot of, uh, uh, we, we take into account this idea that their political constraints and voting are real, um, are real issues here. And uh, we are to the first, to the best of our knowledge, the first one to know that the specific security design firm can uh, substitute uh, regulation. So now let me jump into sorry, the baseline model. So we have two time periods uh, uh, and two technologies. We have a polluting technology that takes it input I and it's going to yield an output uh, uh, that is proportional to, to the input, but it's scaled by this productivity or profitability parameter uh, uh, pi. And then uh, importantly, the polluting technology also has emissions associated with it. So the emissions are for simplicity is going to be given by the production input. And then we have a non-polluting or green technology, which for the same input I uh, are going to yield an output that it's scaled by a, a, a green production parameter. Uh, and importantly, the green production parameter is lower than the polluting production parameter, which captures this idea, which is very common in the literature, that, uh, well, non-polluting or green technologies are less profitable or less productive. And uh, the key is, of course, that also the non-polluting technology doesn't produce any emissions, right? So, so these are technologies. And then uh, moving on to, to the agents. Uh, we have two types of agents. They're indexed by one and two. They have equal endowments age. So the standard agents form a proportion pi of the population, and and one minus pi is, is the rest, uh, the environmental agent. So, um, um, so preferences are quite important when it comes to uh, when it comes to to these uh, to these kind of kind of pa papers. Uh, so. I want to spend a bit of time here. So both the, the both these agents derive utility from their consumption, which is given by the output of their investment. So that's fine. Uh, then uh, uh, both of them suffer this utility from exposure to global emissions. But in addition, our environmental agents also uh, internalize the emissions associated with their actions. So if we denote E1, small e1, uh, the emissions associated with uh, agent one, then the standard one, and E2, the emissions associated with the actions of the second agent, uh, then the, we have global emissions. And uh, um, so, yeah, what, uh, what's the idea here? So these global emissions, E, affect all the agents in our economy, uh, irrespective of their preferences and of their type, uh, and they have no control over these, so they're going to take these as, as given. So they're atomistic with respect to these global emissions. So these can be thought of as natural disasters or, or the negative effects of pollution on health. Uh, and these affect the entire population. Um, so they behave, uh, yeah, as I said, they behave atomistically when, uh, when, uh, when they invest. But crucially, additionally, the environmental agents also internalize the emissions associated with the action. And this is in proportion to a parameter eight, the five, eta. <laughs> eta. Uh, um, so, um, so you can think of these as, as uh, deontological rather than consequentialist agents, or they have also been referred to as warm glow agents in, in the literature in the sense that, uh, um, uh, that they just care about doing the right thing, irrespective of whether this has an impact on the bottom line and the bottom line being aggregate emissions, right? So they just internalize the effect of their actions when, uh, when they invest. And importantly, this parameter, eta, is higher than the difference in the productivity of the polluting technology and the green technology. So this, par this parameter restriction here uh, basically uh, ensures that, uh, well, this is what, uh, this is 
this is what makes the agent green, basically, right? It's going to, he's going to have a, a preference for investing in, in the green technology, right? Because their preference for doing the right thing is, is it's better than the profitability uh, loss. All right, so in the extended model, uh, uh, we allow for, for this uh, lambda parameter to be, uh, um, to vary across agents. So in this economy, everybody is affected by global uh, shock. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's an economy basically in which disasters are, are real, they're, 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 um, they're, they're happening. So climate shocks affect everyone. Uh, but basically when we allow, allow this to vary and potentially be zero, then we also allow for an economy in which climate skeptics exist that you know, think that emissions don't uh, uh, produce any harm. And now, uh, so these are the agents and then the regulator so this is a utilitarian regulator. It maximizes the the total um, uh, that the, the utilities of the agents in the economy. And importantly, uh, we did not put this warm glow, uh, uh, feel good, uh, decisional utility uh, uh, component in the in the in the um, in the regulator's uh, uh, function because well we we have done so, but then a welfare, you know, welfare just look. Great, because people are happy despite the fact that emissions exist in the economy. So basically, leaving this warm glow uh, term out uh, makes us to be more more conservative, um, essentially. All right. So what happens in the uh, let's say fair economy? Uh, well, standard agents um, are going to have a preference for polluting and uh, uh, for investing in the polluting technology, and uh, the environmental agents uh, are going to optimally invest in the green technology given their preference, green preference parameter. Well, the implications in aggregate terms is that, well, we're gonna have emissions. These are going to be, so theta was the proportion of standard agents. H1 was the endowment of these agents. So because they, they, you know, they invest their endowment in polluting technologies, then we have these emissions and this is uh, welfare. Then uh, um, we consider what happens if the uh, unconstrained regulator was to correct this left in the fair economy, uh, introduce a carbon tax. Well, what would happen here? If the tax is sufficiently large, uh, then um, the effect is that the standard agents will also invest in the, in the that's the point, right, <laughs> of, the, uh, of the tax, that standard agents will also invest in, in the green technology. As a consequence, emission, aggregate emissions will be zero. And the welfare in this economy with the tax it's going to be uh, higher than the one in the economy with without the tax. If uh, and I'll you know, sort of if uh, basically this is the profitability loss from switching to polluting to non-polluting. Uh, so if the profitability loss is lower than the exposure to global climate shock, right? So then uh, then we're in a uh, we have welfare gains basically for having done this. Okay, so now, uh, as I said, we, we impose these, we, we take into account these political frictions. So now let, let's see what happens when the regulator faces a, a, a constraint, when it can't just implement a tax, but the tax has to be uh, um, uh, at most uh, um, uh, as high as that that would be supported by the median voter. So we have a median voter um, uh, model here, basically. Um, so what happens if the median voter is a green type? then the tax just passes. The optimal tax that we can implement is, is the one that would reduce emissions to zero and everything is great. If the median voter is a standard uh, a type, then, um, then the tax uh, can only be implemented if the profitability loss is lower than, uh, um, than the exposure to, to, climate, uh, uh, to climate shock here. So here the exposure is also scaled by the fraction of standard uh, agents that would still you know, contribute to polluting. But otherwise, if this is not the case, then, uh, then we cannot implement uh, a tax. Okay, so now let's introduce um, um, market. So we looked at what would be the tax without constraints, what's the tax with constraint. Now we introduce market, uh, we clear the market, and then we go back to asking what's the tax now with market and constraint. So here, uh, so far we've, only uh, um, assume that agents can only use their endowments to invest in their preferred technologies, but now we allow them to lend and borrow uh, among themselves. Uh, and we, we use these contracts that make the cost of that uh, contingent on, on emissions, basically. 
and I've already uh, sort of talked about, we have a fixed component. Uh, so we're going to clear this market and solve for R and for rho. That's where we have this uh, fixed component and, uh, and then the, this variable component here. Uh, and we take this um, target, so the, the, the target emissions are, are going to be the counterfactual, uh, what the emissions would be if uh, this security was not, in the absence of external financing, basically. So for, for the, the standard agents, this is going to be um, the level of emissions from investing in the polluting technology. And for the green emissions, this is going to be zero because they don't have, uh, you know, this is what their counterfactual is. This is what they would do if they weren't to uh, engage in borrowing and lending. All right, so, uh, so if the target is met, meaning that this difference is positive, uh, then, uh, well, um, say an agent that has borrowed D is going to, to have to repay something that has a discount. Uh, but if the target is not met such that this difference is negative, uh, then uh, then the borrower is going to have uh, to repay something that has a penalty. So you have to repay more or less. All right. So um, now what what happens in um, in equilibrium? Well, uh, this lending and borrowing can only happen or only arises if there is uh, no carbon tax. Because in this you know simple economy, if we have a carbon tax, then then that's done. We just have no emission. So if there is no carbon tax, then the market for carbon contingency, uh, contingent financing arises. In this market, uh, standard agents are going to borrow, and environmental agents are going to are happy to provide the the um, the, the funds. And uh, the carbon um, the market implied carbon price well has to be higher than the profitability loss from switching to the uh, non polluting to the uh, from polluting to the non-polluting technology, and it can be uh, as uh, at, max, at most the, the green preference of the, of the lenders. All right, so essentially what happens here is that environmental agents are effectively uh, subsidizing the transition of standard agents from uh, polluting to non-polluting uh, technology. Uh, so, okay, so green agents, uh, because they do so because they derive utility from reforming others. Uh, and uh, um, because of their preferences, right? So, uh, and uh, standard agents, well, they internalize the fact that green agents are willing to pay or subsidize their transition. And so they can monetize their green preferences. And of course, they're, um, uh, they're happy to enter such uh, arrangements because they can, um, they, they are, you know, rewarded if they beat, uh, if they reduce emissions. Okay, so yeah, they, they have incentives to basically enter this, these kind of, this financing agreement, the question is, can financial markets decarbonize the whole economy? So, um, and uh, well, the, the short answer is, it depends how rich or how much money these uh, caliber contingent financing markets are deploying, or how, how large the endowments or, of the green agents that are providing the financing are. All right, so if the endowments of the environmental agents that act our lenders are sufficiently high, then basically all the standard agents can receive financing and they can and, and their transition can be financed basically they can switch from from uh, to the non polluting technology and as a consequence all emissions are going to be priced using security however if endowments are not sufficiently high uh, then uh, only a fraction theta d of of uh, of the borrowers that importantly is smaller than theta so only a fraction of the theta agents can access financing and uh, and can switch to to the non-polluting technology. So um, okay, so that's uh, that's what happens with the market now. Um, with respect to going back again to solving for for the tax with market and, and political constraints. Okay, so if the median voter is a, a green type. Then, if you remember in 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 the market in the in the economy without markets, the green agents were just supporting the tax. Now, uh, uh, basically, they're going to trade off this term, which is the private benefit that they get from reforming others through lending, and the benefit of uh, reducing exposure to to uh, to climate shocks that is brought about by the tax. Right, so. And when we have markets, a fraction theta D of agents are going to uh, be able to access funding and, and switch to the non-polluting technology. So 
when this theta d is very large, oh, before before I get to, to this, actually, let's see, the median voter. So before, uh, uh, the median voter also had these conditions for supporting the tax. So the support was not unconditional. But we, before, we didn't have this term theta d, right? So now, uh, theta d captures the fraction of ages that can access support through market, right? And if this is zero, we're back to we're back to the world without market. But as this becomes higher, you see this condition, uh, um, 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 yeah, become become less likely to be satisfied, and as a consequence, the standard agent is less, uh, you know, willing to to support the tax. But let's talk about the green agent. Uh, um, also, see what sort of drives this here. So, if this theta d is very large, meaning that all the agents, and in the limit, this theta d can be theta, right? So if all the agents can access the uh, um, a financing, then uh, um, then there is no support for the tax. This condition never holds. Uh, so the median voter, the green voter, will never support the tax. But that's fine because markets have taken care of all the emissions. So it doesn't uh, it doesn't matter. Now, if theta d is very small, this condition can still hold. So we can still have a carbon tax that is being implemented. They will still continue to to uh, vote for the tax. But as theta d sort of increases and reaches an intermediate region, basically what can happen is that the inequality doesn't hold anymore, meaning that support for the tax is lost, but not anyone, not everyone can access finance. Uh, uh, so, um, not, um, so relative to the economy without markets in which the tax would pass, we can have a, a welfare losses. So basically the bottom line here is that financial markets tilt the median voters' preference away from the carbon tax from voting for, for for the carbon tax, and now let's see the implications in terms of um, of welfare and um, and um, and emission reduction. Uh, all right, so uh, here I'm plotting these as a function of the of the endowment of environmental agents because these are it's, it's a parameter that captures the size of the market basically how big these uh, uh, these uh, these markets are, and the blue line uh, is the emission reduction that is um, that would be enabled if okay. So let's look at it. That would be enabled if we have uh, a tax only and no markets. Now in these in these plots, I've chosen the parameters such that uh, voting, uh, you know, the, the tax can be implemented, and the emissions are 0 0.6, right? So when we have only a tax, the emission reduction is equal to 0 0.6, which is a way to say that basically we have no emissions in this economy. We can implement a task, the task, is, uh, the, the emissions are reduced to zero, so everything is fine. In terms of welfare, well, this is sort of like a mechanical effect. Welfare will increase with the endowment of, um, of environmental agents, so that's not uh, particularly interesting. Now let's see what happens when we introduce markets. So this black line here is basically the emission reduction that is uh, enabled by in an economy in which we have a quick, we can have taxes and market, right? So when, um, basically when endowment or when the size of the market is very small, when uh, then the, ta the tax still passes because the private benefit to, to, uh, to voters from, you know, engaging in this market and either reforming others or, you know, being rewarded for, for having been reformed is, is relatively small. You know, the, the taxes are small, so we can still have support for that. However, as, as endowments or as the size of the market grow, we can reach the situation in which no, we no longer have support for, for the tax. As a consequence, the emission reduction decreases. And basically this blue square here is the region in which, uh, well, we have emissions, right? It's, it's, it's a loss type of region. We have emissions, but in, 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 a, in a counterfactual economy in which markets did not um, exist, then we wouldn't have emissions, right? So, but as markets increase, you see we can reach uh, um, this, uh, this, this region in which we're, we're back in an equivalent situation as with that with the market, right? And basically the, the here, the results for welfare sort of mirror this. There is in this intermediate region in which we have uh, uh, welfare losses, and that is because markets have have displaced support for regulation, but at the same time, they're not big enough to fund the transition of everyone, and uh, uh, but but only a small fraction, right? Um, but importantly, we also have this 
this region in which, you know, there, there is uh, the two are equivalent. Um, all right. So let me see. Oh, I don't think uh, I'm supposed to stop at 45 past. I think to have a. So very quickly on the model, just what we do, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, we have a mass of, um, of investors that have the same green preferences. They can vary across. And the climate, as I said, the climate exposure parameter can also vary across agents. Here we uh, normalize endowments to one. And uh, yeah, importantly, what I keep, I guess, what the point of this model was is to uh, allow for this continuum of technology, neither, not just polluting or non-polluting technology. So here we allow the agents to choose this abatement parameter delta that has the effect of reducing emissions, but which also reduces output because it comes at a convex cost. And well, the regulator, again, maximizes utilitarian welfare in the same, um, in a similar uh, manner. And uh, so the key results from this is that uh, we see a substitution relationship between uh, taxation and carbon contingent financing. Um, so the market implies carbon price and as well as the level of financing in this carbon contingent market decreases with the tax. And, uh, um, and then support for the tax also decreases in financial markets. And in particular, when we solve for the median voter threshold, this one, uh, well, decreases with the green preference because but this green preference is important. It drives the, the, the strength of the market, basically. The higher the green preference, the more willing, uh, the, the bigger the subsidy that green agents are willing to provide during uh, through markets and the bigger satisfaction they get basically for doing that. Um, so uh, the optimal tax when we have markets is below that uh, needed, um, that, that we would have when we don't have market basically. So again, if there is no support for the tax, markets can improve welfare. However, if some support for the tax exists, markets have this effect that they can dislocate the support, they can weaken it, and they can shift the economy from one that would support the tax to one that doesn't. Uh, and uh, so we can have welfare losses. Uh, so in, the, in particular here, welfare losses are, are, are importantly driven by the, the choice of, of cost. So we have to play with that a bit more. So to conclude, uh, I have talked about this baseline model um, where a climate contingent financing arises with, when there is no political support for a tax. It can fully substitute regulation if the capital deployed is large enough. So this holds for, for either model. Uh, but however, however, markets can shift the economy from one that supports a tax to one that doesn't. And if the capital deployed to markets is not, it's small, then welfare losses uh, uh, can occur. So basically the extended model generalizes this and allows for the two instruments to coexist. And we can see, say something about the interest enlarging substitution relationship um, uh, uh, between, uh, between the two. And given the, that there will be a, like a, a Q and A conclusion here, um, basically I also want to stress the implications or I suppose the, the premise for even thinking about the study. Um, so, trying to understand whether financing can substitute uh, the carbon tax. And we have done this within one economy quite clearly, uh, but this is an important step about thinking about the transition globally, because well, we've been trying since 2009 to just mobilize capital resources and transfer through the form of intergovernment transfer to developing countries to finance their transition. But we haven't been very successful at this. And in the meantime, the capital mobilized through this type of security design that has been um, yeah, implemented, um, has a wider reach and uh, is implemented in countries where support for regulation is, uh, is insufficient. And these securities have the, the, the benefit that they combine the global uh, nature of capital markets with, with the carbon price pricing incentive that that the regulatory tool would have, but which are not uh, yes, um, subject to political constraints. And uh, I will conclude here. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your uh, comments and questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Adelina, for your very thoughtful lecture. Um, I'm going to open up the floor uh, to the audience uh, for any questions that they may have. So. Uh, it would be appreciated if you can raise your hand so I can see who would like to speak. So I think, Franz, you have had your hand up for quite some while. Um, do you want to um, uh, speak up and ask Adelina your question?
I'm not sure that was a. Hmm? Um, I'm uh, France, do you want to ask a question? Okay, then I think we see Daniel. Daniel, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I think if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Good. Um, this is Daniel Hardy from the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. Uh, first, a comment that I think Austria introduced a carbon tax in 2022, even with lump sum transfers of the population compensation. Um, but I guess I had the general comment, general question to you, isn't this more a model of local pollution rather than global emissions in the sense that no one country's emissions make any difference to global climate change? And this is something for, I mean, is, or is this meant to be a model for the whole world? Um, you know, if I'm okay, so in what, what would be the, the dimension? Well, clearly, this is not a it's a one economy model. Uh, but uh, yeah, what what would be the the key? Uh, I suppose um, concern or effect that would play, and and uh, maybe we can still sort of think about it or capture it here. That that we know we're missing out uh, from not looking at more players. I suppose. What do you have in mind exactly uh, for? Well, just have in mind that. You know, Uruguay and Chile didn't introduce these um, sustainability bonds really in order to reduce global pollution or emissions, but rather to reinforce the government's commitment to take the action. Um, is that sort of a, a penalty mechanism which really drives that? Yes. But the, the risks faced by the Uruguay and Chilean population have nothing to do with their country's individual emissions. And the people uh, buying that weren't doing it in order to, there's zero effect on global emissions of what Uruguay and Chile do. Right, because their their contribution to global emissions and what they can do about it, basically. It's well, it's trivial. Very small. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, nobody's, wow. nobody's welfare is mm -hmm. affected by Chile's emissions. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I know it is. I mean, and if, if we look at this uh, this map also where with where regulation has been, you know, implemented. Uh, you know, the the highest this one 137, I think is in. I don't want to be uh, like Sweden, I think. Or some, Pretty uh, high. Yes. Uh, yeah. So listen, I mean, I, yes, I, I know, uh, but I I suppose this speaks to this these type of. I cannot speak to that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, but if we were to think about okay, what what could be done, uh, we at, at the global level we could pay attention to the countries that are the biggest emitters and uh, you know propose uh, these financing solutions to them, right? And maybe pay a bit more, <laughs> give a bit more of a subsidy so that they enter these uh, these kind of deals because I suppose the voluntary issuance of such. Uh, of such instruments by 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 countries like Chile, you're, you're absolutely right. It's not really going to change the world, <laughs> right? I suppose what that speaks to only is that well, these these kind of like I care about doing the right thing, irrespective of whether this matters. These things are a reality. I think these kind of preferences that yeah. uh, that we still really don't know. There's no agreement on how to capture these things, but I they they exist. <laughs> in some form or, or another, this kind of narrow, narrow green. So, Deva uh, Data, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, would you like to Thank ask you. a question next? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Dr. Das, the uh, Dr. Das from India. So, uh, my, my question is that uh, when we have a net uh, zero, uh, you know, goal, and, uh, you know, usually uh, the amount requirement is pretty large. I mean, uh, so my question is that, you know, whether this debt is issuances uh, are enough to, uh, you know, uh, fill this, or maybe the solution could be that the developed countries, they should, you know, come forward and they uh, should, you know, voluntarily contribute for underdeveloped or developing countries. Uh, that is one way. And uh, second thing is that how to incentivize this, you know, debt investors, basically, uh, you know, when they're investing, I mean, usually the return could be a challenge uh, for the companies to get it. 
so in that context uh, how it is going to useful uh, for uh, you know this issuance of you know debt particularly so what, what i i uh, what would be an, uh, a challenge for companies to get just simply to access this kind of uh, funding because of issuance costs or uh... yeah okay well we have uh, seen so there were a few points that uh, I, I guess I, I have I have thoughts on and I would like to respond. If I forget any, please uh, tell me. So there have been a few initiatives in, in Hong Kong and Singapore to subsidize the issuance costs related to uh, to issuing these kind of instruments because these are not necessarily uh, uh, trivial. Of course, a lot has to be done also to ensure that the infrastructure for or technology for measuring emissions accurately is in place. That's that's key, right? So something that we haven't we have implicitly assumed here is that there are no measurement or manipulation frictions in this. Uh, so in the absence of of such things, this works, <laughs> right? Uh, on your other point regarding, uh, yeah, the the needs are much higher than what private markets can deploy. I think, I think this speaks more to to the design and. Um, some attempts are already along these lines are are, are being are being done. Uh, I think eventually building on this design, we're combining private and the public funds that would potentially maybe you know be the ones that are the subsidy, <laughs> the reward for uh, for you know switching to to green forms or renewable forms of technology. Um, so yeah, if these funds were provided by by public bodies, perhaps uh, then private money would 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 flow into but certainly a blended finance type of solution will have to be reached because um yeah perhaps you know private markets are maybe not as big or not don't have as much of an appetite to um you know, to 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 finance huge transitions which are certainly needed um so do let me know if i missed um uh, um, point of your uh, of your your question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, my point is actually uh, somewhere there is a cost which is uh, you know indirectly it is uh, going to bear by the corporate world. So uh, how do you think that you know is it fair that only the corporate has to come forward and uh, they have to you know find the solutions for this? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, governments can also issue these uh, uh, these things. I I suppose um, the governments have um, have um, issued such such uh, instruments. I don't. Yes, I I agree. I, this this should not be. This, I'm not here to say that this should be an entirely a private uh, private market type of uh, effort here to tackle this issue. Um, but it doesn't have to be just for companies. I don't know if this. Uh, satisfactory uh, or perhaps I misunderstood. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? If not, I, I will take the floor. I'll let me first ask the audience if there are other questions. Uh, friends. No, I think that was it. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, First, uh, a comment, uh, not only companies uh, did with uh, green bonds, but also Republic of Austria, for example, recently issued green bonds and they were uh, heavily oversubscribed. But my question is, uh, wouldn't it be, uh, you, you're you only talking about uh, carbon taxes. You are not talking about carbon border taxes. For example, uh, the uh, European CBAM CADA carbon border adjustment mechanism is just uh, starting its test phase. And uh, uh, with the uh, European Task Force Carbon Pricing, we have cooperated since a very long time with the Chinese. And one of the biggest incentives for China to introduce their own carbon pricing was when the commission told them, you have two options. Either you introduce uh, your own carbon pricing and then you get the income, or if you export to Europe, you, you pay in future 
uh, the carbon border tax and then we have the income and we will not share it with you. So a carbon border adjustment mechanism gives an incentive for all the countries to uh, who export to you to introduce uh, carbon taxes. Right. But, so that... but, uh, would you mind stopping to share your slides? So we uh, that was a question by one of the people from the audience. So we can stop see... sharing. Yeah, stop sharing. So you're full. Oh, yeah. you. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead and answer the question. Um. So I think yes. Well, that would have to be on top of a carbon tax for the for the domestic economy. So first, like I that's the I don't think. And at least uh, probably has thought more about this, and we briefly talked about this. this is a hugely important thing for sure. Uh, we would have to be combined with a local, um, a local carbon tax in something, the carbon yeah, yeah. adjustment, um, right? Nice. But uh, the way I would see that sort of like basically interacting with the things that I was talking about here was that, um, perhaps if there's any resistance to from, from a potential borrower to enter these types of uh, of contracts that have this conditionality um you know and and switch um i think the 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 carbon tax the the carbon border adjustment mechanism would would remove that and would make a, a potentially skeptical borrower more likely to enter a contract like this in uh in practice um without you know expanding this to multiple economies i can't um you, you know, like so, I'm, I'm. There's a response to what I could do with with what we have now. We can't <laughs> think about that with what we have now, but that's certainly something important that actually we're thinking about. <laughs> um, um, yes, it's, it's a hugely important, and it can be a, a complementary uh, and potentially um, spur the adoption of such conditional financing. Um, um, so I think there is one more question from Abdel Zelu. Is that correct? Okay, so in the chat, let me see. In fact, uh, could I you please expand on the impact of market size on carbon emissions? Could you give some examples with different country size? So if I understand this correctly, the market size would refer to the the size of the carbon contingent financing market, so the size of the financial market. Uh, so what would be, I don't know if, uh, I think currently, well, the, the issue is that we also have developed, um, uh, we tend to have developed markets in countries where we have a form of, or some interest in <laughs> taxing this thing, right? So my model suggests that we, when you combine the two, then the welfare or the outcome is worse than you would get if you didn't have a, a a market to the implication would be that such funds or, or such financing are best directed to countries or markets where there is no carbon fine, carbon regulation in place already. That's where you get the most bang for your buck, if you will, right? Then when you can achieve uh, uh, achieve the most. So in terms of me thinking of, uh, sorry. We are out of time, I believe. Oh, so I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. We can maybe maybe you can answer the question in more detail in a private uh, email. Yeah, I did. I so, I didn't. Sorry. I would like to uh, thank the audience for joining us today at the Young Scholars uh, webinar on climate finance and economics, and I would uh, much like to thank Adelina for her very insightful uh, presentation today. So thank you again, and stay tuned uh, for future uh, webinars uh, that are coming up, uh, and you can uh, re register by the website. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you.